Looks like people are starting to get settled in. So what we're gonna do is get started now. I would like to welcome everyone. My name is Edie Strinkfellow. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion here at MassBio. And I would just like to say thank you for joining us. You can be anywhere in the world today, but you choose to be here. And I will also like to thank our sponsors for Make Shits Happen. If it wasn't for them, we would not be able to bring this program to you every other Monday at two o'clock. So I am grateful for Al Nylum, who's powering Make Shits Happen this month, everything that they are doing. They are leaders in the industry and also leaders in the community and also leaders in the EDNI space. I will also like to go over the ground rules with you right now. Uh, for the first 20 minutes, it's gonna be a Q&A between our guests and we're going to close your video and audio, but please feel, fine, feel free to uh, enter questions in chat or also make yourselves visible. We wanna make sure this is an interactive program, but after those 20 minutes, for the next 20 minutes after that, we open up the video and the audio for you to be able to ask your questions at any given time. With that being said, I would like to tell you why we're here today and what the focus is on. For me and many other Black, Latino, and Indigenous Americans, we have been carrying the trauma and inequity that has ignited this social unrest that has long been taking place for centuries, but is recently televised and is everywhere. But to these communities, it's not new for us. And while it may be shocking to some, we are struggling with the legacy of centuries of continued exploitation. Well, before the coronavirus, this period of social unrest for black and brown Americans have historically faced considerable barriers within the labor market and also in our industry, including discriminations and in, uh, job searches, occupational segregation, lower wages, increase of risk of being fired and higher levels of unemployment than our white counterparts. As a community, we are mourning. As a nation, we are as well. We need to start identifying what our future will look like and what it means to us inside and how do we all go about rebuilding this country together in an equitable way. And in doing so, and in speaking of which, I want to introduce you to someone who has been building ramps and bridges for this community to the innovation economy, upward mobility, and preparing those for all of us to level up. And also, this man has done so much to be our voice in corporate America, but also in social justice. I can't wait till he just starts telling us about his program and his background. So I'm gonna shut up now. So I'd like to introduce you to the one and only Pratt Wiley. Pratt, please tell us a little bit more about yourself for those who are not familiar with you and also about your background. So first of all, I wanna thank my, my dear, dear friend, Edie. Um, so I, 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 will, I will circle back and share a little bit more, more about her, but Edie and I um, have known each other for really at least a decade, if, if not longer. Um, well, we used thanks. To be, we used to be <laughs> colleagues um, back when I was a practicing lawyer before I, I, I was able to escape that life. And uh, the opportunity to have, a, have a, um, a chance just to spend some quality time with her is all I needed to, in order to say yes for, for today's session. So thank you, my friend. Um, I wanna thank really all the folks at MassBio and Bob Coughlin um, for, for convening um, Makeshift Happen and, um, and ensuring that these conversations have a forum and not just a forum where, where, where we can talk, but we also have a forum where we can act. Um, for those who, who don't know about the partnership, um, the partnership was founded really in a moment or, or following a moment not that um, dissimilar from the one that we find ourselves in right now. Um, Boston had just uh, completed it or had just gone through the busing crisis. And as a result, um, 10 years later, our city saw a tremendous brain drain in the, um, our ability to recruit talent and our ability to uh, retain talent that would come here um, looking for opportunity. Um, the reputation of the city as being hostile, um, being the most hostile in many cases to people of color, 
um, was one that was costing not just communities of color, but also our, our, our companies, our industries, the, the civic life that, that really makes this such an, such an attractive place to be. And so the partnership was founded by executives um, in, the, in the business space, in the business sector, and also from uh, leaders in the communities of color. Um, it really was a partnership. It has always been a partnership, a bringing together of corporate leaders as well as leaders in communities of color. Initially, the, the black community, but now we um, we represent folks of, of varying identities and, and ethnicities. Over the years, we've tried to focus on, on a few key challenges. Um, one is building leaders. Um, creating in uh, our, our professionals of color a, a skill set and a foundation of professional excellence, making sure that, um, that we have the, the skill, the training, the resources that we need in order to not just survive, but really excel and thrive within the, the corporate environments in which we find ourselves. Um, in addition to that, we have worked with companies and to shape the corporate climates, making sure that policies, procedures, and practices are designed so that no matter who you are or where you're from, you are attracting the top talent, you're developing the top talent, and you're leveraging the top talent. And then we're building community. And, uh, and that's a, a really big piece of, of what we do. We recognize that in, in Boston, in part because the Communities of color are, are smaller than what you would find in a New York or a Chicago or, a, or an Atlanta or even a Los Angeles. That we needed to be intentional in creating the networks and the community of peers and sponsors and advocates and mentors, those folks that we all need in order to advance our careers, but also the encouragement that we need as we are planning, planning route and raising our families here uh, in the community. And so those have really become our, our three uh, pillars of our three-legged uh, stool. Professional excellence, um, creating corporate environments, and uh, a commitment to community. A couple of years ago, maybe about five years ago now, we took a look at our programs and we recognized that we, we, had, a, we had a problem, we had a challenge that we weren't, that we weren't uh, fulfilling. And it really was right here in the life sciences. We recognized that the life sciences had really blossomed as an industry right under our nose and that, um, and that the challenges that professionals of color have and, and really underrepresented minorities in, in this particular space have are very unique. So our programs, um, again, the, for every stage of your career, um, have traditionally been inclusive of all industries. Um, if you're a mid-career professional going through our fellows program, you would, um, you might come from the legal industry and then you have someone uh, from financial services and another person in retail and another person in, um, in engineering and you would all be part of a cohort that's part of a larger 100 uh, person class. But the unique challenges in the life sciences made us readdress that model. And that while having programs that serviced all the various sectors of the Massachusetts ecosystem made sense for most, because of the unique um, career paths that, that folks uh, in the life sciences have, and then because of the way that many of our companies and our, and our institutions are structured and the silos in which they are structured, that oftentimes participants were not getting the the, the networks, the training, the support, um, the guidance that they needed in order to excel in this particular industry. So we created the uh, biodiversity program, biodiversity fellows program, um, which is a, really a combination of our flagship fellows program, which has over the years graduated about um, 3,000 participants um, through, through that particular program. Um, for mid-career professionals. And then building on top of that, um, 
additional resources for folks who are just in, in the life sciences, and in particular, executive coaching to help deal with some very specific um, professional challenges that folks are, are working through. Um, and over the last five years, we have nearly 100 participants who have completed the program. Um, and these are folks who are, who are leaders within, whether it's the hospitals, whether it is the, um, the medical schools, whether it, it is the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, clinical uh, trial companies, uh, firms from Biogen to Vertex to Perexel to, uh, to MGH to uh, East Boston Neighborhood uh, Health Center and, and nearly 30 companies that we've worked with over the last five years just for this particular program. Um, and I'm going to just brag for a moment, Edie. If I, Go if right I, ahead. I just want to talk about, um, I'm, not, I, I'm not playing favorites and, and many of you have uh, come from companies that, that have actually participated in our program. But uh, yesterday in, in the Sunday New York Times, there was an article about a physician at MGH in the emergency room who has uh, used his platform and his, uh, his opportunity um, to connect public policy failures on one hand with health failures on the other hand. And so what he has started to do is register voters right there in the emergency room. And it's called Vote ER. Hmm. Um, I left the law firm uh, in order to uh, work in, in voting rights and voter access. So this is, this is a story that an, an organization that I was already familiar with, but I became much more familiar with it because that, that physician is a member of our Biodiversity Fellows Program. Um, so in addition to working in the emergency room during the, certainly the, the greatest pandemic any of us have ever lived through, um, he is at the same time investing in the long-term growth of his career by participating in the, the Biodiversity Fellows Program. And then he is also investing in the long-term health of his community by making it easier for everybody to have their voice heard through election participation. These are the types of leaders that we have going through this program. This is the type of, of talent, proven talent, high potential talent going through these programs who are going to be the, the leaders of this industry and this community uh, for generations to come. Wow, I, I'm speechless. Can you can you say this person's name? Are they comfortable with? Oh, did I not say his name? Well, I mean, it's in the New York Times. I'm, if he's shy about that, <laughs> no, so his name is is Dr. Alistair Martin. Okay. And, and Alistair is a is a emergency room physician at MGH right now. Um, was brought to Boston uh, for Harvard Medical School, and and uh, we are we are so so lucky to have him. He is he's just he's a fantastic kid, and is exactly the the type of of talent that traditionally has been lost, and traditionally hasn't felt anchored to to this community. And so when he was done with his medical training, would be very open, if not eager, to move someplace else. But now because he, he is connecting through organizations like ours and organizations like ODR, um, he's much more likely to stay here, build his career here, and we're all able to, to benefit from that. Well, thank you for sharing his name. And the reason I ask is because not everyone has access to the New York Times. So if, uh, if you don't have a, a subscription, you may can't get past the paywall to get the story. So. At least we can Google him and look him up that way. So That's thank right. you for giving That's us that right. information. And there are a ton of people that have questions. So what we're going to do right now is open up the video and audio if you have questions. And please feel free to uh, jump in at any time. Casey, thank you for sharing the article with us. Casey uh, Barrett Worth just shared the article. It's in our chat feed. So please look there. And uh, Zach, who is assisting with the audio and video if we can open up the mics and uh see who has questions and in the interim uh please also line up in the chats and let's talk about the black corporate america me too movement and the reason i bring this up you were also interviewed 
by the globe and also the business journal and you shared some of your experiences how does that feel right now to be able to openly talk about it without feel as if uh you couldn't openly talk about it before yeah yeah i think i was relatively lucky in that um i was able to work in environments where i I did not feel as though I could not share the experiences of being a, a black man um, with, my, with my colleagues, even though oftentimes I was the only, um, certainly black man and, and oftentimes one of the few black people even within my, within my organization. Um, but, you know, I shared, I shared a number of, of stories and, and none of them are, are relatively unique of, of being pulled over by police officers, and um, I actually shared a story. They, they ended up not not running with it, which was which was which was fine. But um, when I was uh, visiting my parents while I was in I was in college, and I grew I grew up here. I grew up in Brookline, and um, I'm visiting first my um, one of my best friends from high school, and I'm coming back from uh, from her house right down the street. It's a four minute drive and a police officer follows me the entire way, not just from, from one house to the other, but all the way up into the driveway. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that we know that these happen. We know that this happens. Um, we know that, um, uh, that we are, are vulnerable to, to verbal attacks, even if we, we are just walking down the street in our own neighborhoods. Um, and it's a burden that we share. And it's a burden that most people of color carry with them, um, really with quiet dignity. And mm -hmm. what is nice about this moment is that um, we're able to, to share not just what our experiences are, um, but that people are listening, right? I think that's actually the piece that, is, that has been most different, um, that people really are listening and responding and um and, and recognizing that um if if this is happening to executives if this is happening to um senior government officials if this is happening to deans of of universities and presidents of universities imagine what the experiences are for those who don't have our privileges right and don't have our benefits and and, not, and that is, I think, the, the, the healthiest part of this entire conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a question from Joanne Caymans, who is with Adji. Joanne, please go ahead. Hi, Joanne. Thank you so much for, for your words and for your hard work. I, I've been following your organization for a long time with much admiration. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, I love the fact that it feels like the rest of the world is on the bandwagon, finally. I feel that way. And so... The biggest question I get, and I don't know how to answer this, is what do I do for people who work places where their leadership is not yet on the bandwagon, where they don't understand how much of a priority, this can't just be lip service, like, oh, we did diversity training, go and be free, you know, how much it takes to shift the culture. Um, what do I tell those junior mid-level people? Um, they are disheartened. I, I don't know what to tell them. So I think that there, you mentioned both leadership and mid-level. And so let, let, me, let me address both of those. One of the things that's been um, probably re relatively unique about the partnership in this, this conversation that we've been having over the last 30 years, um, and, the, and that to a point is different than say an NAACP or, or an Urban League. This is, yes, racial equity and justice is a good thing for a healthy community, right? And, and, it's, and it's something that we should aspire to just because it's the right thing to do, just to treat people with dignity and respect. But it's also the smart thing to do for business, right? It is the smart thing to do for business. And the way that we look at, at this, the only long-term sustainable competitive advantage that companies have is their ability to recruit and develop talent that the, um, that in reality, with more technology, you know, everybody's gonna have AI, 
everybody's going to have robotics. Everybody's going to have whatever the technology is that's next, right? What differentiates the companies that win and the companies that don't are the talent that is able to use that technology most effectively. And that means the ability to innovate. That means being faster to open up new markets. That means being faster at solving problems. And study after study after study after study concludes that more diverse teams are better at innovation, better at opening up markets, better at solving problems. So if you don't as a leader, want to invest in innovation. If you as a leader don't want to invest in your, your long-term competitive advantage, that's fine. That's fine. But just know that your competitors are. And in the long term, the market is going to judge you accordingly. Now, the, the second question is about the middle managers. And this is actually what we see more often is uh, senior management understands the business imperative of diversity and inclusion and, and equity, but uh, are struggling with how to um, uh, change their corporate culture so that it permeates throughout the middle management ranks, right? And I finally had, had, a, had the best story to really, really share this. Right? We're talking with, uh, some leaders at the MBTA, right? And the, and the T, they just brought on a new team. And, and part of what they were saying is kind of what most, almost any time new leadership comes into a, a government agency is we're going to start running this like a business, right? But and you, what they're really talking about is changing the culture, right? And, and if you're going to run something like a business, if you're going to run a government agency like a business, you're not going to start with interns, even though that's important. Um, you're going to start with what does my senior leadership team look like? Um, and where, where are my, my roadblocks there? What are the incentives that we are putting in place for the executive ranks and the middle management ranks? And how do we change our incentives in order to get the results that we wanna get? And then how are we holding people accountable who don't achieve those results? And that's the same for, for culture. It's the same for diversity and inclusion. You've got to think about it holistically throughout your entire organization, both what, what you have in your pipeline as well as what you already have. And you need to incentivize and re reward people for the behavior that you want to see. And you need to remove those who, uh, who aren't giving you those results. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I I completely agree with you that that's what it has to look like. But I guess what I'm I'm faced with these days more often is leadership that isn't even willing to hear that messaging yet. And and I know you're working with organizations and people who are willing because they're working yeah. with you. Yeah. But what do we tell the people who aren't working? You know. So I, I got a call the other day. I, I'm I do a lot of women's diversity, which is not the same. I understand different problems, different issues, but. Um, where it's you very know, similar, but some similar struggles and a woman told me that she was told with a bunch of other women to form a women's group But that they didn't think any men should be involved hmm. And and you know, that's a huge problem to say here hmm. you people of color go organize yourselves. We'll watch you okay? <laughs> and you, right. you fix this. Okay, that's what she said. That's what it felt like she actually was a black woman as well So she had like all the she said, that's what it felt like. It was like, go in a room, you guys fix it. And then, you know, maybe the ma white males in charge will figure out, you know. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go offline and listen. But um, to me, that's the struggle is what do we do with that completely misguided view? You yeah. go fix it. And yeah. feel free to call us and we can help navigate some of those conversations. Right. I will. Like, this that's is not the first. That, that is a very common uh, circumstance that you're describing. Thank you. And then Pratt, do you want me to put your email address on blast? Is it okay if Please. I share it in chat? <laughs> Please. Okay, because these are my closest friends. You know this, don't you? That's all right. I Any friend them. of Edie's is a friend of mine. I truly Awesome. Mean. We appreciate that. Yeah. And it was one thing that Joanna hit upon. I wonder if we were to treat our Edie and I initiatives similar to we treat a product launch. Now, if we saw it and treat it the same way, do you think we'll get more results? Because if you take a look at the MassBio expanded initiative, we are asking corporations to tie their initiatives to senior executive bonus and compensation structure. 
which is brilliant. <laughs> so, so great to see that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's another story how we got there. <laughs> yeah. But I was just thinking when we were putting all this together and composing and thinking and iron it out, as you and Joanne hit upon, is if we were to treat this as a product launch, I think we would be more successful. What are your thoughts on that? I think that that's right. I think that that's right. I think the, the, the more, well, let me take a step back. Yes. So as we are thinking about change, right, and, and as we're thinking about systemic racism, which is really what, what we're talking about right now. Um, I don't know any entity or group that is better at managing systems and changing systems than business, right? I mean, it's really what, what business does best. And what our society needs right now is to learn from the innovation within the, within the business sector and how you change different systems, right? Um, it shouldn't be easier to put a cell phone in everybody's hand than it is to talk about how are we recruiting the best talent, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it shouldn't be any more difficult to um, uh, research, test, launch a new therapeutic than it is to research, test, and launch public policy changes that can begin to change the outcomes that folks have purely because of their race, right? And so, um, you know, I've, I've worked in the private sector, I have worked in the public sector, now I'm working in the nonprofit sector, and there is, there is, there's no doubt that the sector that is best positioned to, to change is the private sector. Okay, well, we have a few questions for you. Um, the first one starting off is, what is the difference between working with biotech companies as opposed to other industries? So the, so the, so the first is the amount of, training and education that oftentimes folks have when they're coming into, into the space. Um, you may have folks, and in, in this way it's, it's similar to, to medicine, um, but you may have folks who are basically in their first professional role right, in their 30s, right? If, you're, if you've been pursuing your PhD and, and multiple doctorates, which oftentimes uh, folks have, um, they're not in their first real professional role um, until much later in their, their careers. Um, so that's one, is being able to help with that transition. And oftentimes what you um, learn on somebody else's dime as a 22-year-old working at um, a job in, in financial services or, or retail, folks in the life sciences haven't had that opportunity and that, that grounding. Um, secondly is the, the way that the industry itself is siloed. Um, so while there are folks who may have similar career paths, oftentimes we were seeing that the folks in the biotech weren't necessarily talking to the folks in the hospitals who weren't necessarily talking to the folks in the universities who weren't necessarily even talking to folks in Let's even just dip, dr drill into biotech. You have the the large, um, the large established publicly traded companies. You have the smaller um, innovative companies. You have different silos within those companies with different therapeutics, different regions. Oftentimes, even today, we are um, introducing people who work at the same company who have never met within the confines of their company. They're meeting through our programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, that is unique. Um, it's not the only industry where that's the case, but it certainly is, is the largest industry where that's the case. Well, thank you. We also have another question to you. How long do you think this moment is going to last? You know, I'm the wrong person to answer that question. Um, 
So I, I had the, the chance to work in, in the Obama administration. And in that, I w was out in Ferguson following uh, the unrest there. I was in Baltimore following the unrest there. I was in New York. Um, I met with the family of, of Trayvon Martin. Mm. Um, this moment didn't feel different to me. This moment in terms of the, the pain, in terms of the, what we saw in, uh, in Minneapolis, even what we saw in Central Park, none of that felt different to me. The part that has felt different is the reaction of white America, right? Mm. And, and that, that certainly for the first time in my adult life, there has been a, a real, honest, open, vulnerable conversation about race, about systemic racism, and about the, um, the need or the desire to change. And that's not on black people, and that's not on people of color to start, or is it on black people or people of color to continue? Because it really is about white America and, and the reaction to the system that benefits white America often at the cost of black and people of color America. And so the question isn't for me to answer, it's really for, for our white colleagues on the call to answer of how long does this moment last? Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you right now, uh, I have every intention of, of being a black man for the rest of my life. Um, and so this conversation is certainly going to uh, continue for the rest of my lifetime. And, and uh, hopefully uh, we can continue to engage and improve um, during, that, during that period. Wow, that 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 was oh my god, eye opening. I like how you said it's it's not just on you to answer the question; it's for everyone that's on this call right now to answer the question. So, what would you say to the executives that want to avoid diversity efforts because they can only think of them think of the efforts as themselves as quotas? Yeah, um, I think there I think there there there's there's two ways to answer that. So the first question is, um, you've got to reframe the question, right? It's, in some ways, it's not about why, how, how are we creating more space for people of color? For some organizations, they need to answer the question, why are white men overrepresented at every level within our organization? Right? And answer that question first. Secondly, there's, and, and I think this is the piece that's really baked into, into your question. There's an implication that diversity and inclusion means that you are sacrificing quality. Mm. And, um, and quotas are, are a code word for, you know, the head count is what matters and not the quality. And you know what? We've got, we've got, we've got 5,000 people who have gone through our programs. Each and every one of them is as impressive as Alistair Martin. Not each and every one of them is profiled in the New York Times, but each and every one of them has uh, added value to their companies, has been a meaningful contributor to their communities, um, has been uh, a high performer, um, from middle school all the way through to, to the executive ranks. And it's part of why when you look at the partnership in our alumni, you're hard pressed to find any prominent leaders of color in the business space, in the civic space, or in the political space who aren't either alumni of our program or really were the ones who helped build the program in, in the first place. Um, and so if, the, if what is meant by quotas is somehow less than, right, is somehow um, uh, diminishing our quality or lowering our, our bar, then, then you just need to remind folks that, that there is talent there to be acquired. Yeah, they may work someplace else, but you know what? 
lots of companies hire people who had jobs right before that, right? Um, you know, that, that's your job is to go out there and, and through the free market, acquire the best talent that you can. And, um, and you need to take that step back and ask, how can we do that if we are overrepresented by white men? And we also have to get past that. Um, you hear the term talent wars all the time. And to me, it's not talent wars, it's clone wars. And the reason I say clone wars, if you're going after the same people that mirror you, look like you, same background, same experience, that is not a talent war. That is a clone war. That's so right. how do we get back focused on what's more important? Or how do you get people to um, come out of their comfort zone? What do they fear? What, how do we get past this? So it's about networks, right? It really is about networks. Um, cause the clone, the clone wars and now, now I'm thinking about star Wars, Edie. I don't know why you did that. <laughs> May the fourth be with you. I, I, right. I want to celebrate um, it every year. So. <laughs> but, but it's not always about finding a mini me, but it's about finding someone that, that you are comfortable with, right? It's about finding someone who, um, uh, who, who, just it feels right, right? And, and we know that oftentimes right. that's how, how jobs are, are sourced and how decisions are made. And, I, and you know, that's part of, we all do that. We are all guilty of that, myself included. Um, the way that you get out of that habit or the way that you can mitigate the risk of that habit is by expanding your network. Um, it is by ensuring that you are seeing as many different types of people succeeding in as many different types of, uh, of ways so that the, that model of what you have in terms of, is this person going to be a good fit? Is this somebody who I want in the foxhole with me? That definition becomes much broader. Mm. And, and that's another way in which the, the, the partnership and the work that we do um, is is uh, so impactful. Um, we had um, really an, an, an Edie, Edie was, was part sharing. of this at, at the time. I, I uh, had an event back a little while ago or, and I've been kind of recommended to you. Sorry, Sherry, I'm, I'm uh, hearing you as well. Um, we had an event with the president of Howard University. And at that event, we had one of our, uh, the, the EVP of one of our, of our largest uh, partner companies attend. It's his first time actually attending a partnership event and he and I are, are standing in the back of the room and he's just saying, I had no idea that there were this many people of color in the life sciences, you know, executives. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that then begins the, the transformation. Now, now you're thinking about those talent pools differently. You're thinking about who can fill those roles differently. Is that okay? Is that good? Okay, awesome. So we're going to move on to the next question. How do we as Black people hold our leaders accountable as we have had multiple meetings, sharing sessions, etc. recently without coming off as angry Black women, even though we are angry about the situation and how we are treated? Yeah, it is such an important piece of what we actually work with in, in the partnership all the time. Um, the, the most unique challenges of, of being a, a professional of color is how others perceive you and you being able to manage how you perceive yourself. Um, and I talked about, about President Obama, right? And, and how for eight years we watched him and he was never angry. Right. And he wasn't angry because he's just a cool cat. He wasn't angry because he knows that anger oftentimes plays into racial stereotypes. And so he had to learn how to manage in ways that did not play into those stereotypes, but rather leveraged what he brought authentically to the table. And so the, the short answer is it's going to depend. Right. Um, how you navigate those conversations are in some ways going to depend upon who you are, what your 
what your authentic self is, um, what skills and what techniques already you're most comfortable with. But sometimes being angry is, is the right approach. Sometimes being angry is the right approach. And what I will do is I will offer up our team. So if you are having these, these concerns and you're trying to navigate um, uh, how to get from A to B, all right, um, call us. And what we will do is we will, we will um, connect you with, with um, mentors is probably not, not the right word, but a peer network is the right word, a peer network who can help navigate given the, um, the specifics of your particular, your particular challenges or your particular circumstances. Wow, okay. <laughs> we also have another question in regards to data-driven measuring success for these efforts. How do you feel as if everything has to be data driven for people of color, but it's not data driven for white people? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely right. Um, it's one of many um, higher, higher standards that, that people of color uh, have to meet. But the, the, good, the good news is that we meet that, that standard. Um, when the, when the playing field is level, I have every confidence just as we have in other industries, other opportunities, um, when the playing field is level, what you will see are, um, black people, indigenous people, people of color performing at, and oftentimes higher than, uh, the, the population at large, um, in part because these burdens have been placed upon us. For, for so long that uh, many of the, the systems and the techniques that we had developed just to survive um, serve us well in competing on a level playing field. We have one more question coming up, but I'm trying to <laughs> answer this other person's question. But in the interim- There's no well, questions I'm about like, what was Edie like back in, <laughs> in the early aughts? <laughs> Yeah, I, I color my hair, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, I'm a, uh, as I play video games, I'm, 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 a, I'm a level 48. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> you know, we level up. So, you know, when you hit level 99, that's, you know, that's impressive. So I'm very, very proud to be at uh, level 48. And there's so many stories that we could share that, um, that I wish we could, it, it, I wish we just had a, um, maybe we had, schedule a time for a talk back and we could just have a more relaxing time conversations to how you got to where you are and how I got to where I am and how our paths may have varied yeah. in two directions, but we're still in the same place because we're still fighting for the same issues. Absolutely. So I, um, I would love for us to be able to do that, but in doing so, um, advancing people of color post pandemic, what are your thoughts through sponsorship, professional development, and succession planning pipeline? I think all of them are fantastic ideas, right? I think all of them are, are, are necessary. I don't know why we would have to wait for the pandemic to begin to incorporate diversity and inclusion, equity into succession planning. Um, I don't think that we need to wait until the end of the pandemic until we are um, uh, thinking about creating incentives within organizations, whether it's um, for compensation and bonuses, whether it is um, uh, for promotion, there, there, are, there are ways that companies can and should be, and quite honestly, because corporate cultures are changing so dramatically during the pandemic, it, it, they have, this should be part of what is being included. Um, not just the advancement um, piece of all of this, but also thinking about um, some very tangible pieces, right? If, the, if COVID is disproportionately impacting communities of color and people of color, 
Um, what outreach are you doing to your employees of color to make sure that they're okay? Make sure that they're not grieving. Make sure that when they, when they return, remembering that this experience uh, of the pandemic is, is more likely to be very traumatic for them than it is for those of us like myself who have been lucky and who have been able to work at home and, and not, not touched by the, by the pandemic. Um, the pandemic it actually just creates the opportunity. It shouldn't be an excuse for us to kick the can down the road any further. And we also, it's gonna bring us to our uh, last question. What are your thoughts about people becoming more vulnerable at work with sharing their stories? No longer wanting to feel silent, wanting to no, want to no longer feel as if they have to be silent. Yeah, I, th I think that it is a healthy thing. Um, I think that we are at our best professionally when we are bringing our authentic self to the job. Um, it is a big piece of, of what we develop in the leaders at the partnership. And it is hard to be your authentic self when you have to suppress such a key element of yourself. Hmm. Um, you know, they're all things that we have decided that we're not going to share with our colleagues and that's okay. But something as central to your identity as your race, your gender, your, your uh, gender identity, all of these are um, so integral to who we are and the burden and the weight that, that is felt when we are trying to suppress that, that is, is so heavy that while it's difficult to have these conversations, and while we certainly are putting ourselves out there, not just to be vulnerable, but to be um, um, taken advantage of or, or abused or have that, have that act of vulnerability um, in some other way um, disrespected, mm -hmm. it is better for us to lead with our authentic selves and furthermore, it encourages everyone to then also bring that same level of dignity, respect, and authenticity to the conversation. Um, it's very easy to talk about systemic racism. It's very easy to talk about the civil rights movement, right? It's very easy to talk about um, uh, XYZ lynchings or, or whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. It is much more difficult but much more impactful, so Edie, to your point at the very beginning, for us to share our personal stories, for us to share how this and how, how we live in this world, because that oftentimes is what's most surprising. And that is, I believe, what is most likely to actually affect change. And that brings us to a conclusion of our program today. We do want to stress that it's important for companies to continue to work and to support com uh, communities that are going through these issues through society and in the workplace and put in the effort to fix these structural issues and create an economy and a country that truly works for all Americans. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your advocacy as well as your allyship. I'd also like to thank Al Nylum for powering this month of makeshift happen for July. We would not have been able to do that without them. Keep doing everything you do in regards to research, being a leader in the industry, as well as in this space. Also, I just have a few upcoming announcements. Uh, if, you, if you have time, please join us tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna be holding a town hall where the one and only Bob Coughlin, President and CEO of Massachusetts Biotechnology, and I will be talking about how do we eradicate executive cultures and toxic cultures that have contributed to the situations that we are in now. And then what does equity, diversity, inclusion, and engagement look like in our organizations post-pandemic? So please join us that, uh, for that discussion tomorrow because what it all turns in every, Thing that we do is about patient outcomes and bringing upon everything we possibly can to have a healthier society. Also, please join us August 18th for our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Conference. It's our third annual for MassBio. We're going strong. We have over 200 plus RSVPs. 
uh, please register as soon as possible. And if you are a member of, if you are an employee of a mass bio organization, your registration is complimentary. And if you are not, the registration is there. It is a nominal cost, but we also want to make it affordable for those who are not part of the industry. We still want to make sure everyone has access to biotech and life sciences. No one should be excluded. And last but not least, August 26th, we have the State of Possible Conference coming up. It is jam-packed. You should see the lineup. Please go to our website to see the topics that we're discussing that's important to you, that's important to our society, and very important to our patients. I'd like to say thank you again for joining us. Please feel free and welcome to send me program ideas, guest ideas. Have a great rest of your Monday, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Edie, thank you for your leadership. Oh, gosh. Pratt, thank, you. thank you so much. I look forward to us catching up again, and we'll have a, a different call. We can just have a talk and just catch up and see how we all got here today and how we're still doing uh, what we're doing, even though we're in different roles, different industries, but on the same path. Look forward to it. Anytime, anytime. It. I'm happy to Look connect. I'm very happy about it. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you guys.